want to invite you to turn with me uh, today to the book of Philippians. Um, and so uh, we're going to look at one verse. Um, well, actually, that's not true. Um, we're going to look at Philippians 4.13, which may be the most familiar verse. Uh, but in all actuality, we're going to look at the whole book of Philippians um, before we're done with chapter 4. And before that scares you off, we're not going to be here till 3 o'clock this afternoon. Um, we're going to take a real quick run through that because Philippians 4.13 that we're going to look at um, comes in the last chapter. There's only four chapters in Philippians. It's the end of a letter there. And um, the Apostle Paul is writing for a very specific purpose. And that is a very powerful verse. But I'm also convinced that it may not be what we think it is um, very often. So um, I've entitled this all things. And so that verse says, I can do all things through him or some translation substitute Christ there, which that's correct. It is referring to Christ. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Now, what does he mean by all things? And so this idea um, of all things, I'm afraid, sometimes maybe gets misused slightly. So here's where you may see this verse most. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Um, have you seen this on the athletic field? In fact, in the crowd this size, some of you may at some point in your time playing sports had this on some tape around your wrist on a shoe. This uh, looks like probably a soccer player. He's written it at every angle so you can't miss Philippians 4.13 on his shoes. And often when we see that in that context, it seems that, in fact, some people give testimony to that is, I love this verse because God helps me get where I want to go athletically or maybe career-wise if you are a professional athlete. And then as I dug into this, there's some really different kinds of things. It's one of the most tattooed verses um, on people's body. I chose this one. I was like, you can tell that's really fresh and all I could think was, ouch, ouch. Um, uh, it's also pretty common, I, I ran across quite a few pictures of Philippians 4.13 tattoos where Philippians is misspelled. you got to be really careful. There's one L, two P's um, in Philippians, not vice versa. Um, and then some I wasn't sure what to make of. I ran across this image. Um, if you're not here in our sanctuary, uh, there is a picture of um, extremely high uh, sequined shoes um, and it says, stepping high into a new me, Philippians 4.13. Which I guess that somebody's claiming Philippians 4.13 for a total makeover, I guess. God can change me. Now, here's what I want to say. There is um, a lot of uh, misuse of a verse. And, and I'm not here today to coach you up to shout people down. I'm not asking you to stop an athlete somewhere and go, you really shouldn't have that on your wrist. But what I really want to say to you is, I think this verse is so much more than that. And so I don't, I don't mind people. I mean, if you're a tattoo kind of person and you want to put a Bible verse on, this is as good as a lot of them. Um, I'm glad sometimes when athletes bring scripture to the forefront. But let's be sure what... The Apostle Paul, according uh, to the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes for us, what is God trying to communicate to us here? And what is the real lesson along this? And so I began thinking um, that sometimes that verse gets appropriated in a life coach kind of way. Are you familiar with that term, life coach? Um, life coach can be something like this. Um, you can go to lots of websites now and you can have an online life coach and you can see there um, that a life coach can do things like help you reach your goal, be successful and become happy. And so you're getting a coach to go along with you in every aspect of your life to get you where you want to go. In fact, I ran across this definition of life coach. This is from a website called verywellmind.com. Here's the definition. A life coach is a type of wellness professional who helps people make progress in their lives in order to attain greater fulfillment. There's that word again. Life coaches aid their clients in improving their relationships, 
careers, and day-to-day lives. Now, you can already see, we're going to add to that definition from this same website here in just a second, but a lot of people, that's their version of Christianity, is God, and by extension, his son, Jesus Christ, is there to help me improve my relationship, my career, my day-to-day life. There's a little truth in that. I hope that as a follower of Christ, some of those things do improve, but it may not always be in the ways that the world measures. It goes on to say this, life coaches can help you clarify your goals, identify the obstacles holding you back, and then come up with strategies for overcoming each obstacle. Again, I think in the Christian life, we can find some inspiration from the scriptures and from Christ himself about clarifying goals and um, overcoming obstacles and things like that. But that is not Christ's primary purpose in our life. And it leads, that kind of thinking leads to, I think, some people thinking, well, I must not be doing it right. Because I'm having trouble clarifying my goals, identifying my obstacles, and then coming up with strategies to overcome them. Jesus himself is the overcomer. This definition finishes with this. In creating these strategies, life coaches target your unique skills and gifts. And here's where the real essence of a life coach comes in. They're targeting your skills and gifts. And by helping you make the most of your strengths, life coaches provide the support you need to achieve long-lasting change. Now, you see, the real essence of a life coach is someone who helps you tap in to you so that now you can accomplish what you want to accomplish. Is that all Jesus is to us? Is he our coach, our cheerleader, our encourager? I would say yes to all those things, but he's oh, so much more than that. So if I'm assuming that Philippians 4.13 is being used that way, and I'm Certainly not saying that every person who ever has written Philippians 4.13 on that, some of y'all might be wearing uh, those little rubber bracelets, a chain around your neck, something, it may be highlighted um, five times in your Bible. I love this verse like you do, but I hope we love it um, enough to dig into it to say what is it really getting at here, and I suspect um, it's this. Is Jesus my life coach? The answer is no. He is so much more than a life coach. Now, as I began thinking this, what's the question? Is Jesus my life coach? Is he my wellness professional? Does he help me make progress? Does he help me attain greater fulfillment? Does he come up with strategies for overcoming obstacles? Does he help me make the most of my strengths? Does he provide the support I need? Again, it would be easy to answer yes to all those things. But particularly that last question, is Jesus there to support me? Is he there to help me make the most of my strengths? And I think what happens is a lot of the life coach, uh, Jesus is my life coach kind of people, they put an emphasis in the wrong place in that verse. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Um, We just sang a song. Did you notice the first verse says um, that my love often grows cold, that I can't hold myself where I want to be, but I need Jesus will hold me fast. We get it. The essence of this is I can't accomplish anything. And it's so common in the world today to hear you can do anything you put your mind to. And sometimes I want to say, no, you can't. You can't do anything that you put your mind to. We all have limitations physically, mentally, relationally. There are limits to what we can do. And this verse isn't promising superhuman strength. Um, Now, I believe God can do all those things. And in Christ, if God wanted me to go out there and pick a car up over my head, I would do it. But I don't think that's what we claim in this verse. And I certainly think there's more to this verse than God can help me win a championship in whatever sport I participate in. Or God can help me make a million dollars in my business. God blesses some people in that way, but he also leads many people in a very different direction, a different kind of success that this strength is even all the more important in. So is Jesus my life coach? 
Uh, you can buy a t-shirt online that says, yes, Jesus is my life coach. But I'm taking some of what, in, when I started down this road of thinking, is Jesus my life coach, I actually ran across an article from about five or four or five years ago called, um, Why You Need to Fire Life Coach Jesus by Scott Slayton. It was on, some of you are familiar with the website crosswalk.com. Um, he wrote a little devotion and he said everything that was running through my mind in a way that made a lot of sense to me. And so some of what I want to share to you, I'm borrowing heavily from Scott Slayton in Firing Your Jesus Life Coach. So if that's true, if Jesus isn't my life coach, then what is he and how do I treat a verse like Philippians 4.13? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me or him who strengthens me. So as I said, we need to take the emphasis off that I and put the emphasis on him, on Jesus. That's always a good idea when you're reading your Bible. Let's take the I and me out of it quite so much and let's focus on Jesus. Um, so let's talk about this. Where does Philippians 4.13 fit in the scheme? Why does he say I can do all things? You realize every scripture that we quote, memorize, um, and believe in comes in a context. The Bible is not just a random group of sayings. It is books of the Bible, letters like this one is often that are organized in such a way that are meant to, to make sense as a whole. The book of Philippians is trying to teach and preach a message. The Apostle Paul is writing to a church in a place called Philippi and he wants them to know some very important things. And so if you have your Bible, I'm not, I'm not going to read a bunch of verses from that, but you can see if you want to scan as we go through there. Let's start with the first chapter of Philippians. It shows us that Paul writes this letter from prison. So already the context of this is Paul's not saying um, that this career path that I've chosen, and we could spiritualize it and say this calling that God has placed upon him will ultimately end in the greatest success story you've ever seen. It actually does, but not in a way that the world would think so. And most people would go, well, that was fun while it lasted. Well, he's in a Roman prison locked away from everybody else, so I guess his run is over. And in the first chapter, Paul says, it's not over at all. In fact, um, he mentions that the very chains that he's in has now allowed him to do what God has called him to do in a place that maybe he wouldn't have before. He says, the imperial guard, the Roman soldiers there, now all have heard the gospel. It's almost like he's bragging. Can you believe it? I got thrown in prison, derailed from my trip where I wanted to go preach the gospel. But because God chose to send me here, there's some men that know about Jesus now that wouldn't have. And he goes on, instead of railing about his circumstances, um, I, I didn't delve deeply into the research about what a Roman prison would have looked like, but... I'm just guessing any prison in the first century anywhere on the face of the earth was not a pleasant place to be. Can we all agree that that's probably the case? And Paul doesn't rail against his circumstances. In fact, he doesn't even say, although I am um, you know, terribly unhappy where I am, at least God is doing this. He's taking joy in the fact um, in another place, he says, I count it um, my joy to be worthy of suffering for this matter. But here in Philippians, he says, rather than railing against those circumstances, or uh, he doesn't even do the, there's a common saying uh, today, you're, uh, particularly again going to the athletic imagery, uh, an athlete that uh, experiences a serious injury, um, they, their testimony is, this setback will now allow me to have a glorious comeback. As if my success has to be the end of this. And so this is only a setback on the place that where I'm going. Paul doesn't say this setback is setting me up for a comeback. He rejoices that God is using his suffering for the advance of the gospel. Now, in that very first chapter then, we should see what Paul is saying. Here's his exact quote. Verse 12 says, I want you to know, brothers, that's the Philippians he's writing to, what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. So he says, my purpose 
No matter where I go, whatever I do, whatever happens to me is to let people know that they too can have Jesus as their Savior. He says, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to the rest of my imprisonment is for Christ. He says, the guards know it, you know it, and everybody else knows it. I'm in prison because of Jesus Christ. And I rejoice in that because he's using me. And then he says, and most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. In fact, he says now, because of what's happened to me, other people have seen what I've gone through. They're even more encouraged in this. That doesn't sound like Jesus is my life coach kind of theology there, does it? It sounds more like I'm in his hands, let him take care of where I'm going and what I'm doing. And I know no matter what happens, he will use me for what he called me to do and to be, an apostle for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I think the same could be said for every single one of us here. Wherever God leads us, wherever he does, we can rejoice in the fact that he has us in a place where the gospel can be advanced. Now, I don't know every situation here, but I know that's true because it's a universal principle is God takes us to places maybe we never imagined. In fact, he may take us to a place we never wanted to go, and yet he uses us there, and we can glory in that. In fact, in, at, towards the end of this chapter, Paul says he's okay even if he dies or continues to live in this present situation. So whether I stay in prison or even if I die, either way, his desire is still only to bring glory to Christ through his life or his death. Another really well-known verse in Philippians, verse 121 says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He says, if I die in this prison, I get to go and be with Jesus forever. If I continue to live in this prison, I will serve his purposes. That is a powerful testimony. In the second chapter of Philippians, Paul now begins to encourage these fellow believers, these Philippian church members, to conduct themselves with self-denying humility rather than self-glorifying ambition. Is that a word? That was the crux of the sermon last week, if you were here, about giving ourselves, giving up ourselves for the cause of Christ. So can I say to us, we need to be reminded that we are called to self-denying humility rather than self-glorifying ambition. And again... I'm not casting aspersions on um, maybe these athletes at the end of the game when they've won the championship and on the trophy stand and they say, what are you thinking right now? And they say, I want to give all the glory to God for what he's allowed me to do. I think we should do that kind of thing. But couldn't we say the same in the loser's locker room? Shouldn't a Christian believer believe, I got this? Or maybe even more so, the person who was on the worst team in the league who suffered a season-ending injury in the first quarter of the first game never got to play a down. Couldn't they also say, I would like to thank God for what he's allowed me to do? Because both are a calling, both are a platform, both are a way to witness for Christ. So Paul knows that our desire to be great, to be successful, and to create a more self-centered view of life is a constant thing for all of us. It comes so naturally to us. And it comes so naturally even to say, wouldn't God want me to be successful in whatever that may be? The answer might be yes, but the answer also might be God will find even more faithfulness in our failures and not always in successes. And so when we find ourselves in that kind of place, in a prison instead of a throne, we begin to treat other people um, in a certain way. And in our successes, um, um, it, it's become in fashion, if you're uh, winning an Oscar for a movie, a trophy for athletics, a, uh, an award for academic excellence, sometimes we'd like to thank the people who helped me get to this point. And we should thank people who've invested themselves in our life, but doesn't that make me the hero in the story? All these people were here just to help me get to this point, and God used them for my success. 
There may be a grain of truth in that. God does raise up people to places uh, according to his purposes. But we all are in the place that God has called us to be and we're called to be faithful and we draw strength from him for that purposes. So Paul's antidote here in Philippians for um, this, that way, that danger of looking at life as if everybody else is here to help me get to where I'm going, even my life coach Jesus, um, he says in this chapter again, another well-known part of Philippians, have this mind among yourselves which is yours in Christ Jesus. And he says, basically, you should think like Jesus thinks. He says, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. He says, Jesus was at the ultimate highest place in all of creation. And yet he cast all that aside to come and serve the purposes of God, to take the form of a servant here on earth, even giving himself up to the point of death because that's what God had called him to. So the first chapter, he talks about his circumstances, that God has him where he wanted and God's purposes are going forward. Secondly, he says, this is what Christ has already modeled for us. And then we get to the third chapter of Philippians, and he says, um, Paul begins to review his personal accomplishments. Now, some of these accomplishments were before he really came to full saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. But here's what he says. All the accolades, I had the trophies in the case, the degrees on the wall. Everybody thought I was the greatest person ever. And he says, you know what all those things are? Garbage. Those things are worth nothing. Now, here's what some of us, you get to a certain age, um, uh, some of the things we've accomplished in bygone years, they don't seem quite as important as they did when we were in the midst of them, do they? Um, they become things that are in a box in the attic or maybe a plaque on the wall um, that we look fondly at, but are they all that important? It helps to put in perspective is that our accomplishments in an earthly sense are not the most important things in our life unless they are part of God's story being played out in our lives. And so Paul says um, that Jesus, not the means, uh, 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 I'm sorry, in this passage he offers Jesus not as the means by which we attain our personal goals, but as the greatest prize we should have been looking for all along. If you go in my office, there's some plaques on my wall in not so prominent places um, that some awards I've won ac uh, athletically, academically, um, and there's some uh, things that I take joy in accomplishments, but do you know what those things mean mostly to me today? Absolutely nothing. In fact, there's almost a who cares kind of thing about some of those kinds of things. You know what more important is? that the trophies that we um, aspire to are the ways in which God uses us. Also, in my office, I think I've shared this before, I have a little box, and it stays in the back of the cabinet in my office there, but those are much more important trophies to me because they're not trophies of my accomplishments. They're trophies of what God has done. I've saved letters and notes over the years, particularly from my days back in student ministry when some kids, as they've gotten into adult years, have written and said, I just want to let you know what God is doing in my life, and I want you to know you played a part in that at some point in my life. That's a trophy worth hanging on the wall. It's the cause of the gospel. And wherever, in fact, some of those kids, some of those notes that I have were written in times in my life where I was not happy, I felt like a failure, and I would look back on those times and go, man, I wouldn't want to live through that again. Except God was still at work. That my circumstances aren't a measure of what God can do. So that brings us finally to Philippians chapter 4. This is where we find our verse, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. 
After showing that Christ is the greatest treasure that we could possibly have, not the accolades, not the awards, not the trophies, but Jesus himself, for whom we should count a loss of everything else in our lives, play no matter of importance except through Christ. He turns again to his current situation. It's interesting. He writes in that fourth chapter to the Philippian church to thank them for a gift that, he, that they sent to him to sustain him during his imprisonment. And he says, I can't tell you how thankful I am for the gift that you sent to me. Whether that was money or things or both, even sending people to help take care of him um, there. But he says, I've learned something. I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I find myself. Whether I have plenty or whether I have nothing, whether I'm in good health or bad health, I have learned to be content. He's learned to live in low circumstances and sometimes in great abundance. He knows that he is to be content wherever he is. And he says that that's what he's learned. He's lived in that kind of thing. And then he says, you know why I can do that? You know why I can be content and being in prison and being at the mercy of someone giving me gifts to sustain me, he says, because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You see, it's actually a verse that speaks to people by human terms in failure, not in success. It's not a goal that we achieve in earthly terms. It is a reality that we can experience by Christ. And so... On more days than not, when we gather here together, I bet more of us find ourselves closer to that low position than that high position. Yes, we should rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice, Paul says in another place. But there's a time where we say, this is an awful place on an awful day in an awful time in my life. And the reality might be God's got you right where he wants that is the time when you can speak the loudest to people. When we can testify to the glory of the gospel the most. So in light of what Paul is saying about the real Jesus, he had all the glory and accolades. He cast all that aside in order to accomplish the purposes of God. This author I mentioned earlier says we need to lose life coach and cheerleader Jesus because he is altogether insufficient. That's not a big enough Jesus. If Jesus were only there to coach me, to encourage me, to tell me to look inside myself and persevere, I don't need Jesus for that. I can find a life coach online that will do that for me. I need a savior. I need one who gives me the kind of strength that I can be content. I can be used in the lowliest of circumstances. And we don't find greatness by asking Jesus to come alongside and help me fulfill my dreams. A Jesus who only exists to help me achieve my own personal greatness is not the real Jesus. So let me remind us today, all things is a big statement. But it's probably bigger than you ever imagined doesn't mean that I can accomplish all that I ever wanted to do. It means that God can accomplish all he intended to do in you. Whether that's in good or bad, high or low, God will give you that kind of strength. And let me tell you this. Uh, I, I've, I've, I've bashed a little bit and it's really not my intention. In fact, some of y'all are probably going to watch a couple of football games today and I'd almost bet one of those players is going to have Philippians 4.13 written um, on his wristband, his shoes, or something like that. And probably at the end of one of those games, a microphone's going to go in somebody's face and they're going to say, all glory to God for his goodness. But here's what I want you to, to know. The biggest, best most poignant testimony of Philippians 4.13 was when the microphone went in a loser's face one time. There was a quarterback on a certain football team that had reached the pinnacle of college football, the national championship. And on about the fourth or fifth play of the game, he received an injury and couldn't play for the rest of that game. His team lost. All his goals went by the wayside. And as he stood there being interviewed, his arm still limp from the injury that um, he had sustained. Um, they said, how are you feeling? 
And this was his response. I will always give glory to God. I never question why things happen the way they do. God is in control of my life, and I know if nothing else, I'm standing on the rock. That's Philippians 4.13. When I fall on my face and I fail to live up what I wanted in this life, then can I find strength. Then can I find purpose. That's the best example of Philippians 4.13 I've seen. And I've seen a thousand athletes give glory to God in the winner's circle. And then I read that same quarterback in a subsequent interview said this. He said, what did you learn from that experience? He said, what I learned is that God has to be enough for me. Jesus has to be enough for me. And up until that point, I don't think I could say that. Here's a person that says, even when I didn't reach my dream, I found God's strength to use me anyway. Um, And if you're interested in seeing more of that, I think to our Facebook page later today, I'm going to post that interview uh, that includes both uh, what he says after he's out of that situation and what he said on that field. And I've intentionally not mentioned who it is because it happens to be one of my favorite teams. I don't care whether you like them or not. That's not why I love that. I love that because a man of God stood in front of uh, millions of people and he said, I'm standing on the rock and I believe God will give me strength both here and in the future. Um, And look, that was his worst day in his life. He's a lucky man, is he not? We need real strength for real life in real circumstances, and we find that only in Christ. I hope you will find him as your greatest treasure, your greatest goal. He's not our life coach. He's not only an encourager and a cheerleader. He is a savior, and he is literally our strength. I hope we'll find encouragement in that today. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we are thankful Uh, that you love us, that you care for us, that uh, you lead us in the way that you would have us to go. I pray that on this day we would have great ambition for the gospel, that we would dream and and have visions for the ways in which we could be used. Um, And for some of us it may be in very high places and for some of us it may be in very low places. I pray with the Apostle Paul that we would find contentment in both of those places because we find strength in Jesus Christ. We know we could only hope to do that, uh, not in the strength that we have, but in the strength of Christ and in the power of the Holy Spirit. So I pray that you would do that in us today. Let us be victorious and overcomers uh, in the way that you've called us to be, whether it's by the world's standards or not. And again, we trust you to accomplish that in us, and we ask you for that today. In Jesus' name, amen.